Let me set the context for you this way. At North Park Church over the past two years, we've been doing something we call PBJ, Pray, Bless, and Jesus. And so we've been inviting our church to pray for someone who does not know Jesus every day. And then as opportunity arises, take opportunities to bless them. And we had an acronym, BAGELS, for that, which was Affirm, Give, Listen, Eat, and Serve. And the last one is J, Jesus. And so you might be wondering, some of you have been faithful with the praying and the blessing, you might be wondering, what do I do when I get to the J part? Well, I'm glad you asked, because today I want to try to fill in some of that. My goal is to give you another tool in your toolbox. So just like Taste of Alpha will be a tool in your toolbox, today we're going to go to what we call the Three Circles Training, and it is simply another tool to put in your toolbox to talk about Jesus. You don't have to use it. You can use something else. But this is one way that's pretty simple that you can do in as short as three minutes or as long as several conversations. You can use this to talk about Jesus with the people you're talking to and praying for and blessing in your life. So today should be part of that J, just kind of flushing out what does J look like? How do I talk about Jesus? How do I invite others to follow him? And so I'm going to tell you this right up front. Some of you are going to love this. You're like, yeah, it's different. Woohoo! This is awesome. Some of you are going to be like, Pastor Ben, <clears throat> it's not a sermon. Like, this is not what I came to church to experience. So some of you are going to be disappointed. I'm just going to tell you right up front, I really believe this is part of my task as a pastor. And here's why. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul talks about why God gave the church people like pastors and teachers. And so here's Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Now, why did God give those people to the church? Their responsibility, verse 12, is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. So you see how that's framed? The gift of pastors and evangelists is to build up the church to do God's work. And this is what happens in contemporary American church. We often want to outsource ministry. Hey, I got someone I'm talking about Jesus. Hey, evangelist, go get them. Or, hey, pastor, do this. When really the evangelists are supposed to be helping us, how do I talk to my friend about Jesus? I remember watching some clip from someone, and they said, you know what, one way to go into evangelism is just go find a person in your church who's doing it well and say, hey, teach me. That really we should be learning from each other, those who are the gifted evangelists we should be trying to soak in. What, what are you doing? How, how do I talk about Jesus? How can I grow to be like you? And so today I want to see this really as trying to live into this equipping piece. So it's going to be an equipping kind of sermon. It'll be a bit more of a teaching experience than a lecture, okay? And so I want to give that up front just to say today's going to be different, and that's okay. Why are we doing this? Well, as I said before, our opportunities to share the faith are often very small. And they're little windows, and I've been able to blow quite a few of them in my life. I remember one of the ones I regret the most. I was working for a gentleman in, in my high school years, and my family and I were actually praying for opportunities to talk to him about the Lord. So there I was, like, hey, God, I want opportunities. Well, I'm there working with him late into the night, and all of a sudden he decides to ask, hey, what do your parents do? Now, my parents were missionaries working with New Tribes Mission, so this is a really slow pitch right over the plate that you really couldn't miss, except I did. Because there I was, all of a sudden, it's like, oh, he asked, like, oh, this is the moment I've been waiting for. And you know what I did? I just said, uh, they, uh, mm, um, they, uh, mm, train people. For what? Uh, to talk about Jesus. And I looked down at my feet. I made it very clear I was so uncomfortable that I did not want to talk anymore. I was like, shut down conversation now. Boom. And it didn't go anywhere. And I look back and be like, wow, we were praying for it. We were waiting for it. I was investing that relationship, and then what happened? The moment came and I wasn't ready. Today is a part of helping us be ready for that moment. How do you then step into that opportunity and say, you know what? I've got something I want to share with you. So I'm going to suggest a couple things about how we talk about this with our friends. Now, here's two caveats to start. One, if you just see this tool in isolation from PBJ, this can come off very cold. So I'm going to assume you've done a lot of other praying and blessing prior to this. If this is just inserted into your conversation just really out of the blue, and you haven't done a lot of listening, the person's going to feel like you're using them. So 
do a lot of listening, do a lot of caring, and then they can receive this as you genuinely caring and trying to help them out. So that's the first one. The second one, this is a snapshot. I'm going to give it to you in one big shot today. You don't have to get through all of it. It could be a series of conversations. Or it could be, hey, I'll take three minutes and set up an appointment to meet next week for lunch. You don't have to get it all in right, right away. Sometimes we kind of feel like, oh, we've got to get it all in right now. Wait, wait, boom. And we just jump on people. And you know what? This can be a series of conversations. So let's jump into the tool called Three Circles. Now, let's talk about the first step. And the first step is really, what I'm going to suggest is your point of entry. And that's talking about brokenness. How many of you, just thinking the last week, can think of someone that shared with you something hard about life that they didn't like? could be hurricanes. It could be a relationship. It could be work. There's a lot in life that we complain about, isn't there? And it's very easy, if you're listening, if you're listening well, to spot those moments when someone starts talking about brokenness in our world. And so that's actually going to be the, the first part of our discussion. The first step is to, is to wait for a place where they talk about brokenness. Now, I'm going to use a little diagram up here, and that's why you actually have a blank sheet of paper in your bulletin. In case you were wondering, it was not a printer mistake. That was very intentional. So go ahead and whip that out. I want you to fold it in half. So fold it in half. Um, some of you are doing it wrong. Like Do it like this. So it should be like horizontal. You fold that in half and increase it. Oh, you got two. We've been generous with you. Then just take one. That's fine. Just take one. You can just use, sorry, I didn't realize you had two. All right, on one of them, just draw a circle and write on that brokenness. And you know what? We can agree with people that the world is broken. What's some other, I mentioned some ways, but what are some other ways the world's broken? Sickness. What's that? Disease, yeah. Sickness, cancer. What else? Mental health, Mental health. yeah. Anything else? Okay, questions about what does it mean to be, you know, male or female? Yeah, we got questions. So there's, there's some things in our world that are, we'd say we want to fix some of these things. And so then you can start asking, well, how, how do you, people try to fix that? So what are some responses people have to mental health? What's that? Alcohol. Alcohol? Okay, counseling. So some people turn to alcohol. Drugs. Drugs. Yeah. Try to fix what we discover is wrong with us. What else? What about diseases? I'm sorry? Doctors. Oh, doctors, yeah. And some of you are great physicians and care for others. Yeah. What else? Allergies. allergies. Yes, allergies are annoying. How many of you take something like Claritin every morning <laughs> just to make sure you can breathe? Yeah, quite a few. Yes, yeah, so we've got ways of fixing this. Now, do those things usually fix the problem? They... Usually a temporary relief, right? Claritin only works for 24 hours. I know my wife is like, did I take it last night or this morning? Because it's got to do it in the right time to make sure you're, you're getting the maximum effectiveness. Well, there's a lot of things in this world that we can identify as brokenness. And you know what? You can let the person talk about it. You can let them share. How do they deal with this? And so let them work at identifying how, how do people try to fix the world as we experience it. And then how's that working? And so, for instance, you, you, this is where oftentimes we contribute to the problem in the world. The, the person who's realizing, like, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm midlife, and I'm not going to live forever. Sometimes they double down, like, I'm going to work even harder. Or perhaps the parents still not mourned the loss of a glorious career in sports, and so when their kids are coming up through high school, they put the pressure on the kids. Like, you better get out there and you better practice hard. You better be the athlete I never was. And so guess what? We often take our own brokenness and sadness and in turn, we hurt others. And so one of the things I'm going to recommend that you do in this one when you're talking about brokenness is be willing to join the club. Be willing to say, you know what? I'm here too. That I'm a part of the problem. So we can talk about brokenness out there but at some point, I want you to transition to say, and you know what? I contribute to it. So the other week, actually it was just this past week, 
I was driving across Blazier, which is that road over there by Ashton Commons. I was driving to the red light, and it was dark out, and I see a person hobbling on crutches. And I thought, you know what? I'm talking about pray, bless Jesus. I'm going to offer this person a ride. And I had my two kids in the car. I thought, well, we'll figure it out. So I roll on the window, and I get close. And I say, hey, you want a ride? And you know what I got back in return? I got a string of profanity. Well, I was like, what? And you know what? My little generous heart went like, forget you, man. You can hobble your way home. (laughs) So generous. There was a guy obviously in pain. And as soon as he started swearing at me, I was like, forget you. This, this is, I don't need this. And my three-year-old in the back is like, what did he say, daddy? What did he say? (laughs) I'm like, no, don't worry about what he said. Don't forget about that. (laughs) And so, hey, you know what? I thought, there it was. I was like, I'm going to be generous. I'm this great pastor. It was skin deep because as soon as he hit me with something hard, I was like, you know what? Forget you, buddy. I'm done. That's how deep my love goes. And so somewhere in there, be prepared to join the club to say, yeah, I'm a part of the problem. Now, before you go further, I'm going to invite you to do step number two. So step number two is ask for permission. Everyone I've ever talked to about this tool say this is one of the most important steps. And it's important for this reason. If you don't ask for permission, you're going to always wonder if it's there. And as you go into the gospel and talk talk about the gospel, you're going to begin to wonder, is the person trying to escape me right now? And do you know what people do when they sense the other person is trying to get out of the conversation? They usually just keep going faster and harder because... You hate to stop and figure out, it's true, they were trying to escape. So Christians often just like, oh my God, I gotta get it all in. And so if you ask for permission, guess what? It sets you at ease. You're no longer trying to figure out, am I boring them? Am I they trying to get away from me? It just clarifies right up front, do they, are they willing to let you talk? And it might just be simply this, they're willing to give you the five minutes you just gave them. And you can say things like this, hey, I've got something that's helped me make sense of how the world's broken and what, what, what's going on in the world. Do you mind if I share that with you? So that's one way in. Another way is to say, hey, you know what? My pastor gave me this thing to talk about. Would you mind kind of seeing what you think about it? You can let them be a curious observer and blame it on me. That's fine. Um, next week, we actually want to talk a bit more about the transitions because that, that really is a key part of getting into this. Once you have a transition, it's pretty easy for the rest of it. But asking permission is very, very important. And if they say no, you can honor that. You can always come back later. I would say not like the next minute, but give it some time and come back and say, would you mind if I talk to you about that? I really think this might help. Or they might come back and ask you. You can just wait. Sometimes they do. Come back and say, hey, you had something to say about that. I'm interested. Can you you say more about that? So start talking about brokenness. And as Christians, we can affirm that the world is not the way it's supposed to be. So step number three is talking about the fact that This isn't how the world started out. It didn't start out messed up. It is broken now, and we experience our relationships, we experience the world and nature as a a broken place. But that wasn't how it started. That there is another place. And so over on this side, we talk about God's design. And that from God's design, we came to a broken place. Now what... What are some things in Scripture that talk about God's design being a good design? Anybody care to share? What are some good things? What are are some things that affirm that God's design was different than what we experience today? Yeah. Yeah, it's creation. So you go to the creation account. At the end of chapter 1, it says this, And God saw all that he had made. And this is the first time he inserts the word very. He says, And it was very good. That God's design was a very, very good design. It was perfect. The way it was supposed to be. There wasn't disease. There wasn't death. And there's something else that wasn't there. At the end of chapter 2 in Genesis, it says this, Adam and his Eve were both, I'm sorry, Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt, interestingly, no shame. See, part of what we experience over here in this brokenness of the world is that we experience this thing called shame. And shame is this feeling that humans have that says, you're messed up. You are not enough. You are not okay. And if people get close enough to you, it's going to be exposed and they're going to reject you. But that was not the experience of humans in the beginning. 
And God's design was that shame was not a piece of this. It was a good. It, people felt confident in who they were. But that is not the world that we know in brokenness. So how do we get from God's good design to a broken world? Well, you might remember your memory verse from last month, Romans 3.23, which says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What takes us from God's design to a broken world is sin. And sin is doing anything that God does not want us to do. And here's where I encourage you to work into your presentation a couple things. One, Romans 3.23 affirms this, that all have sinned. So everyone's a sinner. You and me, the person you're talking to, we're all sinners. And two, the standard isn't just that you're better than the next guy. Sometimes we, at least as Americans, tend to think, well, as long as I'm just better than the average, I'll be okay. No, the standard is actually God's glory. It says we've, we've all fallen short of it. So we've all missed the mark. Now, here's something you'll have to probably have to make a choice to do if you're talking to someone about faith. I've seen a lot of conversations where I've gotten into trying to prove someone else is a sinner, and that usually doesn't go over very well because of shame. Because if you start trying to prove that they're a sinner to them, defenses go up immediately. I mean, it happens, think about your marriage, your kids, boom. No, I did the right thing. No, I'm a, I'm a good husband, I'm a good parent. We immediately try to defend ourselves. And so if you start trying to poke in there and try to prove it, you're going to get into this attack-defend model, and you probably won't move on. I recommend just kind of saying, throwing it in there, we're all sinners, and then have, have a story where you're able to say, yeah, I am too. That way, it's not like, I'm the Christian, i got to figure it out. You're the bad person. Nope, we're all sinners together. And so talk about sin as a common problem that we share together. And then, you talk about the best part, the good news, that God had a design, it got broken because sin, people decided we're going to do life on our own, but God didn't leave it in a broken place. And so while the world is full of broken relationships and, bro- and broken experiences, God did not stand idly by and watch it fall apart. God has chosen to come, and he's bear- born that brokenness in the cross. And so this is where we talk about the death and resurrection. That God, in the form of Jesus Christ, came and died, bearing the very weight of sin itself. This brokenness fell upon his shoulders. He bore it. And in the process, it says that God reconciled the world back to himself. I love 2 Corinthians 5.19 here. That God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. So you think about all the brokenness we experience in family relationships, in workplaces, in our society, all that brokenness. Guess what? God wanted to reconcile the world back to himself. He wanted to reclaim it. Not counting their trespasses against them. That's a glorious thought. God does not count our trespasses against us. And so he died. But he didn't stay dead. He rose again. And I think in there is one of the hopes that we have as Christians. That the world's not meant to just stay broken. The resurrection is a picture that God is powerful enough to fix the brokenness and has already begun that fixing at the resurrection. And God can continue to do so in the future. And so the good news is that God has reached down, sent his son to die on the cross for us. And then the response that we have to that is faith. So in, our, in brokenness, in sin, we reach out here in faith and repentance. Faith lays hold of and says, yes, I want that solution. I can tell you some of the solutions that I come to in my brokenness are not helpful. They usually make the problem worse. But reaching out to the creator who had the good design and saying, I want Christ to be my atonement or my, my redemption. And then repentance to say, you know what, I'm going to stop doing all those ways that mess up the world again. When my wife says to me, oh, you're failing at this part of being a husband. My initial response is, ah, how dare you think that? And it doesn't help. It never really helps build our marriage if I do that. So repentance is to say, you know what, I'm going I'm to forget the other ways of living life. I'm going to reach out to God's solution. And then finally, the last part is then to begin to realign our lives back with the way God wanted it. So the last one here is restore and pursue.
that having received Christ's forgiveness and repented of living in the brokenness of the world and contributing more to it, we want to realign our worlds with God's, that his design would be the way in which we live. Now, we do this imperfectly, and we're waiting for that moment when God does restore the world to its original design. But we can be involved in that process right now. And I would just say, make sure this goes last. When I talk to people, they often want to put this over here, as if this is the way I fix myself. I just become better. The gospel is first repenting and believing in Christ. Then our response is restore and pursue. This is never the first step. It's always the second step after receiving the gospel. And then you've got the call from Jesus. What does it look like to follow God's good design? It's this. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked them, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And so the life of love is now the invitation that God gives to us after we have repented of living in the broken world, now following Jesus as the way forward. So that's a very, very quick overview of what's called the three circles. You can see three circles, brokenness, the cross, and then God's design. I'm going to invite a friend up now to do this kind of in a short conversation model so that you've seen more of the theoretical overviews of this. So now we're going to just put it in practice real quick. This is my good friend, Mark. Yeah, Mark right there is great. Good morning, good morning. So everyone say hi to Mark. Hey, North Park. Yeah, don't tell them who you are yet, but well, everything about you, so we'll, we'll hold that off till the end. Okay, sounds good. Our secret. I just met Ben this morning, so. Exactly, yeah. We, so we've been talking about some hard, hard things in life. Um, can you say a bit more like some of the stuff that you see that just kind of messed up in this world? Yeah, um, and I do appreciate, Ben, the time that you've been willing to spend with me. It's been, you know, we've talked about real tough the last couple years. Um, when, when my mother died, uh, I don't think we realized how much she was mm-hmm. the glue that held the family together. Yeah. And um, our family used to be so close. And we were talking about everything, and, and um, when hard stuff would happen, they were the ones that I'd be able to turn to. Um, I don't think I realized how much that meant. And then after mom died, mm. and then family just started, especially with my brother, and we talked about this back in 2020 when he started posting stuff on Facebook, and I talked to him about it, and, and it's just gone nuts since then. Everything is about politics. Everything mm. is, um, it's just crazy yeah. in my family. And, um, like it's falling apart. Yeah, that, that's, that's what it feels like. And it yeah. used to be we could share anything with each other, mm. and we can't talk about anything anymore. Um, just even this last week with our sister who's down in Florida and what she's going through. And mm-hmm. I was trying to talk to my brother about, hey, and he said, I, I hate her. Wow. I'll never talk to her again. And I'm thinking we used to be this tight family. And um, most days I can kind of just ignore it. But right now it is just ripping me apart. And wow. so I honestly, these conversations, I feel like are the only place that I can really talk to anyone about it. So mm-hmm. I just appreciate you being willing to, to spend that time and to do that. Well, I thank you for being able to share that with me. Yeah, yeah, it means a lot. I'm, I'm curious, how are you responding to that? I'm not sure that's on, so let's... Can we, Andre, can we use this mic instead? All right. So how are you responding to... Oh, I've kind of given up now with yeah. the... Yeah, no, we, I mean, I try. We, you know, we had hard conversations and yelling at each other and, and then trying to kind of, like, show articles about stuff in the world and... Um, it, it, it just feels like nothing's been working. So it feels hopeless. At this point, yeah. At this yeah. point, it does. Yeah. And again, it's what it used to be. That's, that's the thing that really just hurts. Is, um, and realizing that that thing that was just the center, that was the thing that I could always turn to. And mom kind of dropped out of there and kind of left yeah. this, this mess behind. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It sounds like your family is feeling some broken, brokenness. I think that's a perfect word for it. Yeah. And, and probably always was a little bit that way. Mm. Um, but with mom going and yeah, that just, it feels like that changed everything. You took, said that she was the glue and now it seems like it just fractured. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Wow. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. 
hey, I've got something I'm curious if you wouldn't mind me just sharing. It's kind of how, how I make sense of the world. Would, would you mind if I shared it with you? You're going to make sense of the world for me? Well, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. You let me know. Please. It, it might. <laughs> I, I would love, I mean, honestly, anything right now. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I experienced the world that way too. It's, I experience a lot of things that are just messed up in our world. And we're just going to call this here brokenness. So you've, you've talked about family stuff. Yeah. And we always have ways of responding to these things that we experience. And so it sounded like you said you just kind of gave up, just like hands off. I'm, I'm done with this. Is that Yeah, I mean, fought for a while, and then I'm just kind of giving up now. Yeah. yeah. So there's all kinds of things in our world that, that aren't, the, aren't fun, that are just messed up. So any, anything else you can think of that's just kind of messed up and broken about our world? Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, my sister's down in Florida right now. So you, and, and what they're dealing with. The hurricane? That you're talking yeah, about? yeah, like Fort wow. Myers, like right in Fort Myers, right? Ooh. Like literally whole house underwater. Everything's a mess right so now. So we've got natural disasters. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Anything you're doing with her to help her out? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Trying to. Yeah. I mean, mostly just kind of like sending texts and encouraging. Uh, okay. You know, we're going to, um, you know, we invited them to stay with us right now. Um, they're doing something different, but they know we're here for them if they need us. So we've got natural disasters. Yeah. It seems like the texts are helpful, but you wish you could do more. Is that fair? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can't fix it. Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of things in the world that are just really kind of messed up. And so I'll, let me just sh share a little bit about how I make sense of this. And it comes from my faith background that what we experience in this world is not the way it was supposed to be. And that's probably why we get mad at it, that it's, we expect something different. And so well, when the world was made, God made the world and he made it a good world. And his design was that it would be a good place. That it would be a place where people did get along. Families mm -hmm. loved each other. And we didn't have hurricanes destroying houses and pe where people lived. And so that, that was the world that God envisioned. And unfortunately, humans preferred to do life on their own and rejected that plan. And so there was a des good design, but we got to this broken world and we got to it because we chose to do this, we call it sin. So I don't know if you've heard mm -hmm. that word can seem a little stodgy at times. It just means yeah. we didn't like God's design and chose to do our own way. Yeah, yeah, and I think I talked to you about this. I went to church when I was a kid. Okay, great, um, yeah. And yeah, I, I remember that word. You remember that word. <laughs> great, well, here's the thing about the Bible. It says that we're all sinners, and you know what? I don't always like to believe that about myself, hmm. but I found it's true. And I know it's true because when my wife says things like, hey, you could do better, you could vacuum the carpet, my initial thoughts are like, no, I don't want to back in the carpet. I want to do my own thing. That's sin? I'm not loving my wife, am I? Okay. So, and, and then there's people who really rub me the wrong way. And you know what I want to do to them? I want to ignore them. I want to send them nasty texts too. Mm -hmm. And that's not helping. That's contributing to the brokenness. Yeah. Like I, what, I always thought a sin was like murdering someone, right? So those are extreme forms of it, but there's small ways we fail to love. And any failure to love is a sin. Huh. Okay. And so we're all a part of this. Now here, here's the great thing about God. He could have said, you know what? You guys chose to live in that bad world. You know, sometimes like your kids act out and they do something, you're like, fine, deal with the consequences. God could have just said, fine, it's yours, I'm walking away, deal with it. Yeah. But he didn't. And so this is a really cool part that God did not stay up there and say, yeah, you guys can deal with your own brokenness. He actually came into the world. He actually suffered with us. He actually died. And that death was bearing all the weight of this. He died on our behalf to assume all the brokenness of the world. And then, I know this is crazy, but he didn't just stay dead. He rose again. On Easter morning, we celebrate the day when Christ Easter, came yeah. forth from the grave yeah. to demonstrate that God isn't just keeping us back here in brokenness that he has conquered sin and death itself. Think about all these things that you're talking about. The relationships that are falling apart, hurricanes that are killing people. In the resurrection, God's making all things new. And he invites you and me to receive that, and we call that faith and repentance. Faith is reaching out and saying, I want to trust Christ alone, that he can save me. And then repentance is saying, you know what? All these other ways that I respond to the brokenness of the world, even hopelessness, my response, that's not what he invites me into. God wants 
to bring the world back to how he designed it. And so what God's doing, and the resurrection is the first hint of this, that God wants to restore the world back to its original creation, back to the way it's supposed to be. So he invites you and me to love others and to walk and to restore and pursue his original good design. And one of the things that he calls us to do is to love God, first of all, but then love our neighbors as ourselves. And that's not always easy. When you have people like your family at each other's throats, just pounding away at you. But God calls us to live back into this world right here. We don't do it perfectly, but he wants to restore the world back the way it's supposed to be. So that was a quick one. And you know what? I, I have kids. I need to pick up at the bus stop real quick. Yeah, yeah. Could we? I, I'm curious how this hits you. And can we get together for lunch next week? I, I'd like to talk a little more about it. Yeah, that sounds good. All right. Yeah. All right. Let's See. do that. All right. Bye, Ben. Peace. All right. All right. All right, so this is Mark DeJay. Mark, why don't you tell them who you are and why you're here? Uh, I, I am here because Ben invited me to join him here today. Um, <laughs> I am actually uh, a part of our presbytery. Who here knows that you're a part of a denomination? Show of hands. Yeah. Hey, great. And who knows what the name of that denomination is? The Evangelical Presbyterian Church. Evangelical Presbyterian Church. I'm a pastor in the EPC, and part of my work, uh, working with people like Ben, is in helping our churches in what we call church health. We define healthy churches as those that understand that they exist to make known the good news of the kingdom of God in their communities. That's why North Park is here. That's why all of our congregations are here. We have about 75 churches in our presbytery, our regional body of churches. We have about 700 some in our, uh, in our denomination. And we want all of our churches to be having conversations just like this one. What does it mean for our church, not just to take on the activity of evangelism, but in our identities to become evangelistic communities of faith. So putting the E back in EPC is one of the ways that we're framing it. And so the fact that for years this conversation, North Park, making it your own, and then having a tool like this to be able to use, we're coming alongside churches right now to encourage conversations just like this one. And so I knew Ben was doing this with y'all today, wanted to be a part of it. And I said, hey, if I can be helpful, use me. And he said, I got a job for you to do. Uh, I need you to get saved. So we're not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> that's next week at the, Th at the that's lunch. That's next week? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. And an awareness that there are always, we always hope that there are people who don't yet know Jesus who would feel welcome to come into our space for worship. And so my hope is that there is someone or someone's here today who you're not sure about that story of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I hope that you're getting to hear from Ben and in the course of the next couple of weeks, an invitation for yourself to consider and experience this new life in Jesus. And so really uh, grateful to be here, grateful for this conversation you're having. Keep it up, and you're a part of a big family that's doing it together. So thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mark. Am I done? Yes, yes. All right, so next week we're gonna pick this up. We're gonna develop it a little bit more. We're gonna talk about transitions into this and look at Jesus and how he transitions seamlessly between real life stuff and spiritual reality. So we're going to talk a little more about that next week and help you kind of work through how do you want to transition into the conversation about faith. So let, let me go ahead and pray as we close. Um, we'll spend more time next week on this. Lord, thank you for not leaving us in a broken place. That you have reconciled us who are wayward children to yourself. And Lord, I pray that you would help us be ambassadors of that same reconciliation people in our world that have disowned us, Lord, may we still portray and make known the glorious goodness of your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.